Jag heter Helena Nordafelt och det här är Drupalspåret. Idag ska vi föra om för- och nackdelar med Drupal och andra CMS. Vi ska få veta varför myndigheter ofta väljer Drupal för sina verksamheter. Och vi ska få höra tre kunder eller beställare beskriva varför Drupal har hjälpt dem med deras verksamhet och möta deras behov. Det händer mycket inom open source-utvecklingen och även inom Drupal. Förra torsdagen så släpptes den första och efterlängtade officiella versionen av Drupal 8. Så att den här konferensen har verkligen bra timing. Kvällens eller eftermiddagens sista föreläsning ska handla om hur Drupal 8 kan hjälpa dig som webbplatsägare. Innan vi sätter igång skulle jag passa på att tacka våra sponsorer utan vars hjälp det här spåret inte hade kunnat bli av. Och de ser ni här, A Wave, Happiness, Åderland och Wunderkraut, där jag själv jobbar också. Eh, vi finns här utanför och kan svara på alla möjliga sorters frågor, helst om Drupal, då får ni bäst svar. I kväll så kommer det vara ett mingel som är sagt att ske på Wunderkrauts kontor. Det kommer att bli flyttat, för vi har fått en jättestor vattenläcka. Så det kommer ske här istället och börja vid 17.30. Då kommer vi även att få träffa kvällens sista talare Robert Douglas som kommer att köra en presentation igen här på Minglet. Och vi kommer även att få möta dagens första talare Jeffrey Maguire. And uh, talking about Jeffrey Maguire, uh, he's standing here eager to give his presentations on, on uh, how come so many governmental bodies chooses Drupal. Jeffrey Maguire works at Aquia and is traveling the world giving speeches about Drupal. And now the time has come to Sweden, Stockholm and this conference. Welcome up. Great, thank you. Thank you. Give it away, yes. Oh, okay. So, ah. <coughs> Some of you might have found a sticker on your seat. Um, and if you didn't, I found some more in the bottom of my bag. Please come and ask me. I know that uh, people in Northern Europe, I live in Germany, people in Northern Europe are sometimes a little bit shy. So um, consider this an icebreaker. You have an excuse to come and talk with me now. Don't just take one from the front of the table, though. Let's, let's talk. Um, this is not my presentation. So I'm just going to imagine. Nope, that we'll find it now. Ah, that's mine. Yes, I have the enormous privilege. My, uh, my job title is, is really, really cool. It's called evangelist. It's, uh, sometimes it's open source evangelist. It depends a little bit on the audience and the situation. But I do have the incredible privilege to be something of an ambassador for the Drupal project and our technology and, and our community with uh, and as uh, to businesses, to governments uh, quite often now, um, as well as working for Acquia, which is has done a lot for Drupal itself, has made a lot of contributions. And um, I really, really enjoy the chance to do things like, uh, I just found the badge from last week inside my inside my jacket. I was invited by the economic spokesperson of the Green Party in Berlin in the German Bundestag to come and talk with them about uh, transparency and innovation in the digital economy. So uh, the topic uh, today is really, really perfect and it's, it's, um, it puts together a lot of things that I've been thinking about quite actively recently, but over the last few years. I'd like to talk about what I call the definition. Um, who works in an agile process here? Yeah, so we're going to do a definition of done, right? What is successful Drupal government, just for this presentation. Um, just a quick reference. What do, I, what do I mean when I say open source? What is Drupal? Um, I want to prove that Drupal is delivering this definition of successful Drupal government. And I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about the GovCMS project in Australia, which is an amazing example of this succeeding. I will not be able to name check even a fraction of the organiza governmental organizations that are using Drupal in the world. It's an incredibly successful vertical for us as a community. Who here in the room would call themselves a Drupalist? Who is a Drupalist? Okay, okay, nice. There's a lot of you who didn't put your hands up. Um, 
Who here is looking for some sort of a web application, website solution, and they've heard of this Drupal thing, and they thought, well, Drupal 8 is finally out. Maybe I should learn more about this. Oh, excellent. So everyone who's a service provider, notice who that just was. <laughs> um, oh, and I'm going to round off with a little story about government infrastructure that I call 100 Money. Who works in government in some form here? Wonderful. OK. Obviously, if you have any questions afterwards, I'm going to be here all day. And I, would, I love, I literally love talking about this stuff. I'm going to say that for, the, for, for today's, um, for our hour together, that successful digital government is about collaboration, transparency, participation, and innovation. It's practices that support, um, you know, people being able to come together, to work together, uh, to support vibrant, innovative economies, and so on. I give some other talks where I talk about the definition of successful digital business, which is very similar. Um, obviously, a government has to be somewhat successful as a business operation as well. You know, cost savings and risk mitigation uh, definitely play a part. But uh, these are the four factors I'm going to be talking about the most today. Open source. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, there's this, if you look, if you have a Venn diagram of uh, free software and open source software, they're very, very, very close, but they're not identical, and they're mostly um, differentiate in approach. Free software, especially um, in the view of Richard Stallman, who invented the concept, is really, really about freedom. And I would like to make a note here that I'm talking about open source as a practical business concept, essentially. Um, I believe very strongly in the freedom aspect, and I think since the Edward Snowden revelations that it's essentially clear that Richard Stallman was right. If we don't own and control our devices and our software, um, we cannot be free. It's a very, very difficult challenge to master today, but um, that's kind of the backdrop to all of this discussion. So open source, I boil it down to what I call the four freedoms. They're very close to the three freedoms that define free software. But you can take this stuff and you can use it. And you don't have to ask permission, and nobody can take it away from you. And it has a license cost of zero money. It's not free, but it has a license cost of zero. And this gives you an enormous power to invest your money where it's needed, to invest it in training and functionality and all sorts of other things, instead of investing in sending it to Oracle, to Microsoft, to whomever, to ask permission to see if their software could work for you. Your price of risk with Drupal is giving your developer a week or two uh, of time to go and try this stuff out. Um, and it makes innovation an awful lot cheaper. You are free, um, and this is essential for government practice, you're free to study the code. That means that you can look at every single line of code and decide if it's safe enough, and decide if it's good enough, and know that there's nothing hidden inside there, no, you know, Trojan horses or whatever. And that this risk mitigation story is incredibly Im uh, important for us as government practitioners. You're free to take what the Drupal community has given you, and with Drupal 7, that is a stable, scalable, easily, quickly deployable uh, CMS with nine or 10,000 plug-in modules for you. You're able to take as much of that as you want, put it together, and get to 80, 90% of your solution very, very rapidly. And then, because you can modify it, you can add something else to it or change the existing functionality to get to your 100% solution. So from minute zero of your project using Drupal, you have literally millions of hours of coding by tens of thousands, pe thousands of people already working for you. And it's a huge head start. And this gives you huge cost savings and huge efficiencies. Um, and the best um, point of all, in the end, you can share anything that you've done with it. So let's say you've made the ideal solution to run government websites, as they have done in Australia. Well, they've open sourced that. All of the GovCMS is on GitHub and on Drupal.org. And you can take that, and you can make the distribution that's compliant for Swedish government accessibility standards, um, security standards, and so on, based on other experts in your field having done the same thing for their specific region. Um, but government requirements are very, very 
similar all over the world. So you could take GovCMS and discover that it is 95% of what you need to make a, uh, you know, a Swede CMS or whatever we're going to call it for the day. And these four freedoms um, obviously multiply each other and, and make this virtuous circle. Um, once you have all four of them in play, you have in incredible powers. And, and in Drupal's case, it's turned Drupal. Drupal, I, I don't say it's just open source software anymore. I say it's community software. Because once someone fixes a bug that's giving me problems, um, and I just get that fixed for free, and when I add a feature and pass that back to everyone, you know, everyone is working together. Everyone is helping each other. We call it uh, building on the shoulders of giants. And we've ended up with 30, 35,000 active developers, 150,000 active users on Drupal.org, uh, thousands of service providers um, all over the world, translations uh, of Drupal in an enormous number of languages, um, and you can have all of us on your side too. I like to talk with smaller Drupal service providers when they're pitching for contracts. I like to tell them, hey, so one, one argument that you can say along the way is that, you know, if you hire us three, actually you are hiring 35,000 developers. You know, in Drupal, if you're going to use Drupal 8 for your project, which is mostly a good idea now and will be a better idea every day going forward, um, 3,300 core developers have worked with you, for you, to make this product that you can download and start with. It's fantastic. So um, this virtuous circle has led, in Drupal's case, to an enormous amount of synergy. This has worked for other open source software projects in the world. Drupal has, is, uh, is unique in terms of its scale and activity. So that was a little background. Now I'd like to talk about, let's, I'd just like to give a few proof points. Does Drupal deliver collaboration, transparency, participation, and innovation? Uh, the examples I'm showing each have something of those, one or more of those aspects in them. It was a big deal for us in uh, Drupal when whitehouse.gov was migrated to Drupal, and it's been on Drupal um, since very early in the Obama presidency. But before that, there was a guy called Howard Dean who was the first internet candidate in the United States in the presidential elections. And uh, Howard Dean had a thing called Dean Space, and it was a Drupal distribution that you could download as a local organizer, and you could build a local organizing site, you could make events, you could do fundraising, emailing, you could do everything that you need for political activism. Um, and it really propelled him into um, you know, in being internet famous and, and um, but it changed how political campaigning worked, um, and you had a situation in the last presidential election in the United States. Uh, Mitch Romney's entire digital presence was Drupal, as was Barack Obama's, and this tradition of activism remains with us today. Uh, Amnesty International is completely on Drupal. Uh, the city of London is on Drupal. The city of Croydon, the city of Westminster, Brighton. Um, it's been adopted. You know, these people who use it in their campaigns then brought it with them into government. So it's, um, you know, NASA uses Drupal. The Department of Energy in the United States uses Drupal. Um, and I'm just trying to stick to uh, government examples. The government of Vietnam uses it. Uh, the state of Nordrhein-Westfalen in Germany, the state of Hessen in Germany, some of the federal ministries in Berlin. I mean, it's got a huge traction in <clears throat> political circles. This will mean that you'll find a lot of communities of, of your peers who have thought about how to solve your problems as well, and that's really, really valuable. So the United States Constitution made a promise, uh, made several promises to the United States, uh, the people of the United States, and one of them was they had a right to petition their government. But if you think about in 1787, uh, uh, 1791, it was very, very difficult to, to communicate at all at any distance. And, and through the uh, 19th century um, and in, through the 20th century, people would create petitions and they would organize and they would be on the phone and they would be writing letters and they would collect millions and millions and millions of pieces of paper which they had to send to Washington DC that then had to be verified by hand. I mean, it's as torturous. It was an incredibly high barrier to communicating with your government. Drupal delivered the White House through an app called We the People. It's an online petition act. And the White House said, we are going to fulfill this promise of the Constitution for the digital age. Any petition that you put up here that gets 25,000 digital signatures, the White House will provide an official response. Now, 
I like also to talk about how this very abstract virtual thing that we do with, with just light on screens has a real difference in, you know, can make a real difference in the real world. One of the differences that this particular petition made was that the limit for how many signatures were required before the government would answer a petition was raised to 100,000. Um, the White House's response to this particular petition was, this is not the response you're looking for. <laughs> so, um, but this is fulfilling a, a promise of participation and transparency in process, and it's very, very important. Open source software is incredibly Darwinian. Um, on Drupal.org, bad code dies or bad code gets fixed, okay? Same with insecure code. So, um, people like uh, the defense departments uh, around the world are, are using open source code and using Drupal to run their systems because it is completely auditable, because they can put the most stringent security standards on it and make it pass. And it's, it's very, very, very important, and that's only because of transparency. And I just, I think that transparency is one of our most potent weapons in open source, and I'd like to just slightly diverge and talk about transparency in detail for a couple minutes. When do I have to stop? Oh, shoo. sorry. <laughs> um, so, it, are there any Norwegians here? Oh, well. So, you know, there's a hotbed of radical thinking in Norway called the National Association of Accountants. It's, it's, it's okay. You can laugh, it's okay. I'm, I'm really trying. Um, so there was a there was a government uh, a few this is a few years ago now there's, there was a call for creating a new standard for um, cash registers in the country now I, I you know Scandinavia doesn't have much problem with corruption but of course the government spec for like the new how a cash register had to work um, said stuff like it shall not be possible to change the entries in retrospect um, or change the preset text on goods and services at registration it shall not be possible to record sales without a receipt being printed. Um, it shall not be possible to print more than one copy of a receipt. Uh, it shall not be possible to mark some groups so that they're included in reports and some so they're not. So, I mean, this standard, like, good accounting, let's not, um, you know, let's fight tax avoidance stuff. The National Association of Accountants came back and in a position paper to the Norwegian government said, the only way that you can gar guarantee auditability is if these cash registers are driven by open source software because it's the only way that you can truly audit it. And it's a, I think it's a great, I mean, it's, it's great for us and I think it's true. This becomes very, very important in a world, well, for one, um, in a world where people are very ethically challenged when there's a lot of money floating around. Look at VW, you know? I live in Germany. Germany is incredibly proud of, of the, the ecological technologies, the green stuff, all this going on. But hey, you know, Germany is a high tech country and some engineer figured out a very simple way to decide when a car was being tested by the emissions testers and run it efficiently, but then make it, you know, really powerful and fun to drive the rest of the time. And, and who cares about um, the environment? That's terrible. And that's driven by greed. Okay, and that greed is supported by the fact that the software in those cars is just a mysterious black box sold by Bosch, and we can't control it. The only way to fix that problem is with something where the source code is open, right? This gets much, much, much more important. Like, I don't care how you feel about the environment, but when you start to think that as we get older, we're going to have hearing aids in our bodies, pacemakers, um, perhaps bionic contact lenses, I don't know, but there's a lot of computers that are being put into people's bodies now. There are pacemakers with Bluetooth um, connectivity in them in people's bodies now with no security protocols. And there are proven attack vectors for people to break them. Imagine a hearing aid that only lets you hear what you're supposed to hear, right? Or tells somebody else what you're listening to. We don't want, I don't think we want that. And the only way to deal with that is with open, auditable systems, and those are only possible through open source. It's a, even slightly more tangential, but I was having a very interesting conversation with some people online about self-driving cars. This is quite a good read. 
why self-driving cars must be programmed to kill. And the argument was a lot about the ethics of, so if your car knows that it goes straight ahead, it'll kill, you know, seven school children. So, but if it throws you off to the left of the road, if there's a cliff and it's going to kill you, the car actually, um, you know, if you work through the ethics and logic of it, the car should kill, choose to kill you, right? Um, and my argument was, whatever ethical system, whatever base implementation you come up with, um, you know, as a society, as, a, as an industry, as a government, whatever, and there might be more than one, right? Like United States cars might choose one thing and Swedish cars might choose, it doesn't matter. Whatever the standard is where you are, that needs to be open and needs to be implemented in an open way. Um, to avoid, you know, suing a developer, one of us, for murder because of the car the choice made. You don't want that, okay? So openness, transparency is incredibly powerful. I hesitate to say he's a friend of mine, but we are pretty, I, we're friends. I'm not friends with Corey, but we know each other. I'm friends with this guy called Oral Balkan. Oral Balkan, um, we were, those are photos from the Republica conference um, where we were speaking. Oral Balkan has this product, project called Indie. Indie's amazingly interesting, and I'm not gonna tell you anything about it because I don't have time. But he said this. Right? And I think this is a perfect sum summary of, 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 of the transparency argument. If I have to say trust me, don't trust me. Right? Um, I was speaking with a, a, another friend of mine at a party this weekend, and she started to get really suspicious of that. Um, and I had, to, I, had to, um, I had to differentiate. I said, okay, in our interpersonal relationship, there are things where you know, we do need to just trust each other. Right? But when I talk about software, machines, you know, computing, government, all that, this is then valid. But it was a really interesting point. Governments produce an incredible amount of data, a huge amount of data, and this iceberg is supposed to imply that until now, the vast majority of that data has been locked up in, in, inside of, of systems, um, maybe in non-standard formats, what have you, and very, very little has seen the light of day over time. There's a wonderful... Drupal distribution called DCAN, and DCAN is a Drupal distribution specifically designed for making open data portals. And it's been very, very clearly shown that open data portals in the world in general are a huge engine for innovation, a huge engine for innovation. And DCAN is being used at the White House. DCAN runs data.gov.ru in Russia, open data for the city I live in, in Cologne, for Bonn, um, and for a bunch of other pieces of the United States government, it's being used, used a lot more. But this is Drupal driving innovation and driving openness um, by simply, you know, being a great data processing, da data presentation layer. Um, and it's fantastic. And on the, on the, on the side of innovation, um, Blink Reaction, which is now part of FFW, um, created the Drupal open data portal for the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority. And last time I checked, and I don't know, that was a few months ago, uh, there are at least 77 mobile apps built on top of that open data stream that Drupal is powering. Um, and given that it's 77 apps, I would say, right, that's probably paying for the livelihood of 50 families, something like that. That's really, really powerful as a politician. If you could say, we're going to take Software that has a license fee of zero, and we're going to implement it in-house because it's done with open standards and it's, it's all completely stuff that we know how to run. And we, can, we can't guarantee, but with a high degree of probability, we can say not only will our citizens be better informed, but people will create economic value out of that data that didn't exist before. The guy who runs the DCAN distribution told me that Oh, he had some numbers about the ECIF. Ah, right. So this guy who runs DCAN claims that um, it's a guy called Andrew Hoppen. He used to be the CTO of the New York State Senate, and he, he runs a company called New Civic now. Um, so there are some claims in the United States that, that simply opening up uh, data can unlock three to five trillion dollars of value. I don't know what that really, really means, but this is an example. This is a very clear proof point that that works. So very, very briefly, I've tried to show that Drupal is on the front lines of government practice today and that it is delivering the possibility to collaborate and be transparent and participate 
and innovate. Um, actually, one of the interesting features of DCAN as well is that you can kind of do it in a, you can, you can um, it's got a function to do data collection as well. So you can run one of those sites that says, you know, my, my, my street lamp is broken, there's a pothole, you know, there's graffiti, um, those kind of data, re reverse open data, you know, uh, crowdsourcing to government. So, so it's a, it's, it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great solution. So I hope that I've given at least enough of a taste to say that um, Drupal community software is, uh, uh, you know, a tool in the toolbox of, of doing open source, uh, successful digital government. Now I'd like to talk about the GovCMS project in Australia. And um, so GovCMS, the, the code part of it was born out of a Drupal distribution called agov mostly created by an Australian Drupal shop called Previous Next, where I have uh, several friends, very innovative, very, very exciting Drupal shop. They've done a ton of core uh, contribution to Drupal 8. Um, they've got uh, a two or three people in the company who are really hardcore core contributors for Drupal 8 and a bunch of other people who've contributed patches. So anyway, Previous Next, really, really interesting people. AGOV was created to fulfill a lot of standards around um, accessibility, security, and so on for Australia. And the uh, Australian government, mostly in the person of its CTO, thought for several years about what are we going to do. We've seen how the United States has done it. We've seen whitehouse.gov. We've seen gov.uk, which is a fantastic open source project and the uh, British government digital standard is very exciting. What can we do? Like, let's take let's let's take all of these best practices and let's do one even better. And they really rethought how they want to present government to the citizenry of Australia. So it's a lot more than just code. I cannot touch on um, all the awesomeness that has gone into GovCMS. I'm going to give you some links to a podcast and a, um, a presentation about it. Uh, that's on my virtual uh, developer event page. But um, let's go into this a little bit. So GovCMS is a Drupal distribution, and that comes from, um, I think it's uh, principle three of the Australian government open source software policy, which says reuse before buy before build, which is really, really nice. And um, they were clear that they wanted open source, and they were clear that that was the way to go. And um, they're also, straight out of the gate, they were convinced that using open source, they were going to get better security, better reuse, therefore economic efficiency. Uh, they wanted a rich pool of resources to build on, they wanted, um, and they wanted no vendor or technology lock-in. This was their decision matrix. Um, it's interesting, and we don't know why, but it was very, very specifically, um, they did not, well, .NET wasn't open source at that point, and um, it's questionable to me how much open source community momentum .NET will ever have. It's got a great community of professionals, in any case. And they didn't want Ruby. I don't know why. 18, <laughs> 18 finalists, um, the, the short list was Drupal, Magnolia, and LifeRay. And I've seen uh, some of the assessment report, and Drupal was not, uh, Drupal 7, this is, you know, the assessment was done of three or four years ago, um, parts of it maybe up as, as close as two years ago, Drupal was not necessarily the winner in maybe usability in, in various specific points, but I know that what took Drupal over the top, what, what really led them to, to choose it for the GovCMS platform is the community. No other project has the level of community support and no other project has uh, the number of professionals supporting the platform. Um, so, so we won sort of um, because of the, the mass of people and um, also frankly because compared to say Typo3, I know that's not on this short list, but um, Typo3 or Joomla has no Acquia. And the fact, um, you know, Acquia's, the reason it was created in a lot of ways was to close to make, to make Drupal's commercial ecosystem complete by offering commercial support. 
Um, and it's very, very important to a lot of large, large organizations to know that you can call someone and, and you know. So Acquia, a lot of Acquia's function in the world has become being a guarantor for this technology that we all love. So GovCMS is a sort of a whole out-of-the-box thing. Um, sorry, this is not very readable. There's a platform. There's a software distribution. There's a deed, which is essentially like a, a codified set of practices. How do we patch it? How do we do security? How do we accept new code or modules? Um, all of the government stuff, and it's very, 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 very important for them to maintain compliance. So that's a very critical piece of the picture, and it, has, it's a, it, is, it is not code. It is, it is rules. Um, and then professional services, and they've done it in a way, the professional services piece is really interesting. Um, full disclosure, uh, 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 Gov, the Australian government is a very bit large client of Acquia, and we play a very large part in government, GovCMS, but, um, and I hope I'll try and remember it at the right point, um, because the distribution is open sourced, and because it's a totally known quality, um, any government agency can hire in any Drupal shop to do the work for them, and then um, put it on the GovCMS platform, which is based at Acquia, um, and you know all of the procurement, all of that stuff is, is very, very highly simplified and, and taken care of. So there's this wonderful opportunity for us actually also to stimulate the general Drupal economy around providing government services. I mean, Australia is a fairly large country, and there are thousands and thousands of agencies that need uh, websites, and they have a very clear path to choosing Drupal on this platform, which allows them to give uh, work to their local economies. I, I love that story. So it's a Drupal distribution, um, and it goes on a platform that kind of looks like this. So it's all in the cloud, um, and it's on the AWS instance in Sydney because of uh, the data requirements in Australia. Um, uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, disaster recovery options in place, 24-7 monitoring. Um, we've got seven years of on-site and off-site uh, archives of every activity, every single change on every single site has to be recorded for um, because it's government stuff. Um, so we've got that happening at several different places, um, and the, there's a really there's some really interesting. Um, there are several, they have a they have a map of three different kinds of government sites. Um, they have a type one site and a type one. The existing GovCMS distribution does what they need. Um, they spin it up very quickly and easily, customize it where they need to, and they just go. Um, and when I say customize, it's mostly about turning specific features on and off and, and how it looks. And most of the Type 1 sites happen on Acquia Clyde Cloud Site Factory, which is like a templated sort of WordPress. Who, who doesn't know what that is? Oh, okay. Well, it's, you know, like WordPress.com for Drupal, sort of. Um, it, gives you, it, it gives you a lot of ease of like governance and, and maintaining your corporate brand and so on. Um, and it's an easy way to spin up a lot of sites quickly. They have a pattern two. So there's pattern one. Pattern two sites are everything about pattern one is cool, except it needs something more that's not been integrated into, into GovCMS yet. Uh, and so generally what happens with a pattern two site is that it'll get built and it'll be assessed. Um, and the feature that made it not a pattern one will be integrated, and therefore that site becomes pattern one again, and GovCMS is bigger and better. And there are pattern three sites which um, are done on Drupal, but they don't fit the specific um, you know, site factory implementations or anything else, and they never will, and they're made on their own, but they're still based on the GovCMS as the base so that um, compliance and auditability and so forth are um, taken care of. There's a highly, highly regulated set of patches and modules that are part of GovCMS and anything else that needs to go in on top has to pass an incredibly stringent audit, audit process. Um, there's a whole workflow for that. Um, and they are approaching it in, they never want to add code if they don't have to and they're considering the, you know, the well-being of the platform and so on. So um, they've thought about this a lot and it's, uh, it's, it's a nice model. Um, they get, just as an example, going into a little more depth, they get um, security compliance out of the box. So all of this stuff happens um, right out of the gate. They've also got contracts with um, CDNs, and they've got DDoS protection in place. So um, that's very, very important to them. The support offering is really interesting. Um, Acquia's businesses support, and, and, but we essentially support them on, um, you know, we were involved in, in codifying the best practices around how the distribution should work and all the patch model and that stuff. And we support our infrastructure, obviously, but um, so 
they've done this thing where, where they're not forcing any department to choose Drupal. It's an official recommendation. You are welcome to use it, but you can choose to use anything else. It just so happens that the Department of Finance, however, has a help hotline and technicians who will work for you at the you know, interdepartmental rate um, and has the security audited platform for you and has the approved Drupal distribution for you and has gone through all of the uh, tendering processes. So if it's a Drupal project, you don't have to write a tender with at least three respondents that has to be out for six months. Like You don't have to do that. You can literally start a government site as fast as you can code it and get up online. We know there are sites going up from conception to, to being fully featured online in four to six weeks. So um, you, don't, you can build your site in whatever you want, but they've got this really, really beautiful carrot here saying this is, this, this is the path of least resistance. Um, so this support offering is this internal support within the Australian government that makes it incredibly, incredibly attractive for people. Um, it comes at a really, really competitive cost point. Um, because they've built it already, not just because of the license fees. Um, and the return on investment overall, of course, is massively improved. So, um, and it's government source, so you get all the, uh, pff, it's open source. So you get all the benefits of, uh, of that, that that we were talking about earlier. Um, this is, um, I'm sorry the slides are kind of boring, but um, I'm hoping that the story is interesting enough. Um, so. Government agencies get radically reduced setup costs with this, and they don't have to go through lengthy procurement uh, processes, I was saying. Security is taken care of. Um, <clears throat> they can be very agile in how they work, and I don't mean that in our software way. I mean they can just be nimble and responsive and do what's needed. And what we're seeing coming through is that they're changing their approach to communicating with, with their constituents. They're like, hey, let's build a website for that. Like, let's take a survey. Let's do this. Um, and they're getting excited about the possibility they can just open up and communicate with people, and they're being encouraged to, and it's really, really working. And um, obviously, they have the benefit of being on a highly supported, highly secure platform. As long as they implement it how they're supposed to, you know, they're pretty safe, so that's great. Um, the Australian citizens, um, they, I mean, the government's also in implemented a style guide, usability guidelines, and so on for the front ends of these, so Australian citizens are seeing an increasingly unified look and feel for their dealings with the government online, and that's, that helps. I think it's comforting, and you know, if you sort of start to understand where people put things, how the menus work in general, um, that's good. And they're seeing that these online services are rapidly improving, and the government should be able to pass on the cost savings to investing in other things that people actually care about. So there's, it's, it's great for the residents of Australia as well. Interestingly, and I hadn't thought about this until I talked with a friend of mine who worked on the project, government employees have a huge benefit from this. Um, you know, the developers can contribute to open source, which is nice, and they can work with agile processes, which is nice. And they use a modern, up-to-date tool set that's also nice. But if you are a developer for the government, if you're some sort of content author, if you're a site administrator, if you're anyone who has to live and work with these sites, hey presto, they're all standardized. They have the same data structures, they have the same authoring interfaces, they have the same approval workflows, and it doesn't matter what ministry you're going to, you can literally, if you've been working in the Drupal system in the, in the Ministry of Finance, you can walk out and the next Monday you can be working in the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Health, wherever you are, and find the same systems, and you're up to speed and running, and it's not that you have to go learn their crazy in-house system that they sort of kludged together over the last 15 years, and their site core system, and their Drupal system, and their WordPress nightmare, right? It's all the same. So government employees have a much more transferable, up-to-date skill set. Government departments have radically reduced training costs over time, radically reduced onboarding times. It's an incredibly powerful tool for making people happy at work, making people want to stay at work, and, and really reducing cost, which is, which is essential, right? And then the Drupal community gets this flagship, I mean, an entire continent is adopting Drupal. I'm really proud of that. That's really, really exciting. Um, and we are also free to look at that distribution and make it better. And we're free to take it and use it in Sweden, and use it in Germany, and wherever we want. As the Drupal community, we can do that, and that's incredible. It's increasing the overall uh, level of technical savvy and the Drupal skill set, specifically in Australia. They've got a healthy community, but more and more people are learning Drupal because there's a lot of work 
right? There's a huge opportunity now in Australia, so our community is getting bigger because of this, right? And we've also really put a stake in the ground as the Australian government, as Drupal, as Acquia, as previous next, as everyone who's worked on this, saying this is how we should be doing government today. This is digital government par excellence. And, you know, everybody involved has been very, very thoughtful about it. And, and it's, an incredible, it's an incredible project. Fork it on GitHub. Download it from Drupal.org. It's right there, free to have. You got the picture? Okay. I have, um, so my most active stream online is probably the Acquia podcast, and there's a sub-series, so those are conversations with people about, um, essentially, I'm interested in the tech intersection of technology and humans, um, and I talk about open source and culture and business and technology and all that stuff. I talk to a lot of really interesting people, and I learn a lot, and so, you know, it's nice that I can call it part of my job. There's a sub-series there called Jams Dev Camp, and... Um, it's essentially a virtual conference. Every few weeks, I'll put up a podcast. So the audio goes out. There's the video of the conversation. You go to that page. There is a full session, like a conference session, a technical session, how the Australian, you know, how GovCMS was built, how to implement, you know, this workflow, what is the deal with PHP 5.6, like technical stuff that you'd want to see as a developer, as a geek at a conference. Um, so there's the full session video. All of the slides from that, if there were slides in the presentation, all embedded, all the links and references, the session description, what I had to think about, uh, you know, what I thought about it, what I wrote about the interview. So there's this huge canonical reference for all the stuff that I talked about with this person plus their session. Um, and I, I really like it. So there's one of those for Government as a Service, Architecting GovCMS in Australia with Adam Malone. And um, it's incredibly interesting. It goes into a lot more detail than I did about the points that I talked about. Um, I encourage you to have a look at that. Here are some resources from the Australian government about, um, about uh, GovCMS in general and their, and their policies. So I hope I could convince you so I started with the definition of what successful digital government looks like today, um, what open source is, what Drupal is, and I hope I was convincing enough to say, look, Drupal is really doing this in the real world. We talked about GovCMS, what it is, how people are benefiting from it. Um, and keep in mind, GovCMS has been running less than a year. I mean, we're in the really early stages of this, and it's exploding. It's, it's, it's so, so, so exciting. So, awesome. I have plenty of time. I promise to tell you the story of 100 money. For this sort of stuff, objects, right, things, there's, we have uh, an economy of scarcity. Um, there is a certain number of them, and a certain number of people want them, so classic supply, demand, economics, you know, uh, uh, fewer goods, high demand, prices go up, all that stuff. And it's based on the premise that stuff runs out. Well, <clears throat> and, and in open source software, and what's very, very difficult for a lot of people to wrap their head around is open source is an infinite, or open source software is an infinite resource, right? And the more people who download my software, the more valuable it becomes. It doesn't lose value because it runs out, it actually gains value. Somebody downloads it, downloads it and finds a bug and tells me about the bug and I fix it, my software is more valuable, right? Open source economies are really powerful and really, really weird, and they're really hard for us to think about, um, given how the physical world works. So if I'm a government, if I'm a politician, if I'm a bureaucrat, I think generally that I am some sort of an idealist. And this is why open source and government pass so, uh, uh, fit so well together, because um, most open source practitioners, I think we, we're idealists too. I think we want the world to be a better place. And, you know, we've discovered that open source so software lets us do that. If I'm a government, I want to make the world a better place. I can choose to spend a hundred money building a bridge across a river, right? And, and my, my theory is, if these people on either side can get to each other, communicate with each other, trade with each other more easily, there will be economic value created, communication makes more peaceful neighbors, uh, all of that stuff. I think that the world will be improved if I build this bridge for 100 money. And I spend my 100 money and I see what happens. 
and maybe the world's a better place. I mean, I hope the world's a better place. Um, I can spend my 100 money sending vaccinations to the third world. To, I can spend 100 money on, on helping refugees. Sweden and Germany right now are two countries um, who are, who, you know, really, really doing much more than their fair share in the terrible migration crisis that we have right now. So I can choose to spend 100 money on, on vaccinating people. Um, and that is generally considered a good thing. And generally, if people in developing countries are healthier, they live longer, therefore they can improve their own lives. Therefore, um, you know, maybe they'll be less inclined to leave. Maybe they'll be less inclined to fight. Uh, it generally, making people healthier and happier and better educated in their home, wherever they're from, is considered a great way to improve the world. And governments are very active in this. So spend 100 money on a bridge, spend 100 money on vaccination or education or what have you. Um, if I'm a government and I decide that the world will be a better place by bombing the crap out of somebody, um, that's, a, that's a classic move, right? It's not, I don't like this, I don't support this, but it's a classic move. A government will say, you know, you, and so I can spend 100 money on bombs. I spend the money, there's an outcome, I'm done. In an economy of plenty, I can build open source infrastructure, government infrastructure with open source software, be it GovCMS, be it We the People, what have you, uh, the DCAN distribution. I can spend 100 money and build my GovCMS and any of my peers anywhere in the world can take my infrastructure completely and reuse it and improve it and give those improvements to me and anyone else can use it. And the more people who use it, the more valuable it becomes and the more of it there is. And the, I can spend 100 money, right? And have a return on investment of N, right? It, it, you know, of course there's a physical limit to how many people there are on the planet, but Spending 100 money on open source infrastructure in government really allows you, you know, if you've had a good idea, it allows you, an, you know, essentially infinite return on investment, which is amazing. You can literally write software in Sweden or Australia or what have you. It'll benefit the people in the United States and Iran and Japan and Russia and wherever you want. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. So, you know, investing government money in open source software is an incredibly good and incredibly powerful idea. I encourage you all to do so, and the practitioners among us, I encourage you to help our colleagues in governments and uh, public bodies. And um, thank you really so, so very much for inviting me up here. I love coming to Sweden. Any excuse is a good excuse. Don't forget to ask for a sticker if you're shy. Um, so, find me on acrea.com slash podcasts. I have a new side project starting soon at thinknation.co, and it's a big deal, and it is involved with the intersections of, of humans and technology. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about on, that online very, very soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay. No, it's Sweden. Yeah. Well, while, while you're thinking, I have one. Uh, what do you think is the major challenges for gov governmental organizations using Drupal and open source techniques? There are a lot of challenges, and one of the very interesting ones actually comes out of the lessons in um, the adoption of Linux and uh, LibreOffice, open, open Office, and other open source technologies in government administrations in Germany. Um, the city of Munich has, is a very famous example of getting open source right. They have their own Linux distribution called Limux. They have their own form processing software called uh, Volmux. They are, uh, the city of Munich is a member of the Open Document Foundation and contributes to LibreOffice, and it's fantastic, right? And they've had a lot of teething problems. They've had a lot of problems because there's not that, um, there's not like an outlook. There hasn't been a good outlook competitor in open source until, um, I think Colab is going to win the war, but anyway. So there's been a lot of teething problems, but they've been doing it for 10 years, and it's been great. And there's a city near me called Gummersbach, where the IT department, one and a half people, right, just decided to take the entire city off. It's a city of two, three hundred thousand. 
take the city off of Microsoft. They changed everything over to Linux. They didn't ask, like, of course, they had permission from the city administration, but they just did it. It's incredibly empowering. But then you go to Freiburg. They were trying to do the same thing, and the, the bureaucrats were like, well, this is ugly. This interface doesn't work. This is not like Microsoft Word. How can I, you know, use Messenger on this? This is terrible. And in the middle of spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of euros, the, the, the union of the, uh, of the bureaucrats, right, forced the city and the region to roll it back and go back to Microsoft. So they lost the investment in the technology and had to eat crow and go back and pay a lot more money to Microsoft. The city of Berlin? Yes, Rob? Well, I have the next question. Oh, okay. And the city of Berlin? Um, I gave a talk in Berlin, uh, uh, um, well, I've done that several times. Let's see, not the last one, the one before last year sometime. I was talking to a, a, a much, much larger room of geeks, and it had just been announced that the city of Berlin, which is completely broke, and utterly in financial ruin, was going back to Microsoft Office as a city. And I thought to myself, one, I thought, I'd want to be the salesman who had that meeting because my bonus is going to be killer. Two, it turned out that they were going back to Microsoft Office because they were using, in 2015, they were using Open Office from 2010, and they hadn't run a single update since 2010, and they're complaining about compatibility problems, right? <laughs> open source is a contract. It's not free as in beer. It's free as in puppies, OK? Take this puppy and help it grow and nurture it, right? Or feed these puppies and let them become what they need to be. It's a lot of responsibility. You can't just like throw it out there and walk away. We have to train people. We have to support them. Um, so the big challenge, right, is getting the people on your side. Because as, as geeks, far, far too often we're like, well, this is free and this is like the good thing and this is right and it's like the code is really on the day. And forget that end users um, people less technical than ourselves can have some real challenges around it. And that's actually been a big hindrance to adoption um, in like city state level bureaucracies in, in Germany, which I happen to know pretty well. Robert Douglas. So my question is, it's well known that companies like Microsoft, SAP, Oracle spend lots of money and effort lobbying for their software to be adopted by government. Who lobbies for open source? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think very many people do yet. In Germany, there's an organization called the Open Source Software Alliance, and it is the um, child of some essentially very, very early Linux user groups. Um, I'm trying to convince Acqui to join it right now, and it's very, very interesting. I'm just starting to learn how Berlin politics work um, with my contact with the Green Party economic spokesman there. And um, so one of the big things in politics is position papers, right? White paper, position paper, recommendation papers, and Apparently, politicians really love that, and, and given that they probably have no time, like I have no time, then if you write, write, read something written by an expert, like I guess that's how you, it helps you make decisions. So the Open Source Software Alliance in Germany is writing position papers and has working groups about education, about um, you know, different aspects of, a, of the thing. Um, and I don't, you know, I think, it's, I think it's kind of a fledging thing, and I don't think enough people are, are doing it for us, frankly. It's, I guess it's a challenge we need to think about. Yes, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm from uh, the municipality of Alling Source, just outside uh, uh, Gothenburg. And about this Gov CMS platform, is it something you, I can use in local government? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you follow those links, and, and you can see the software, and you talk with Adam Evertson, who's in Gothenburg, and who knows a lot about Drupal, and you guys hang out, invite me for a beer, right? And, and, but no, but seriously, it definitely, definitely you should have a look at that. Um, you know, the, the, like I said, it's very specifically built for the Australian government's needs, but you know, you need multiple sites. You need the swimming pool site and the library site and the school site, and you need the city council site, and you need the data stuff in the back, and those requirements are pretty universal. There's also a Drupal distribution called we the People, that was written very early on for US government needs. There's a, a one for the Canadian government. Um, so this concept is, yes, yes, please. Thanks. Adam? Good. Yes. And last question over here. 
Hey, I am uh, working for kind of governance, but uh, let's say international governments funded the uh, NGO, and now uh, we are using a lot of open source CMS because we cannot really afford the uh, API server or really expensive CMSs. So I've been dealing with open source at different platforms and different uh, developers all around the world because we cannot really afford sometimes Stockholm agencies. <laughs> so my question is, uh, not, uh, well, now I am having Drupal uh, uh, website and database built on Drupal and it's supposed to be open and we supposed to be able to change developers, uh, different agencies supposed to work for us in multiple ways. But I always have trouble with uh, making one group of developers to take over from others. And the way it's just super frustrating, I just, it's just, um, that's the point of us, to, we, uh, so why we choose Drupal. Right, and so this is, a, this is a, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this is a known, this is a very known problem space. And um, especially if you look at Drupal 7, which has been in the wild and, and working, you know, I guess it's been a full release for five and a half, almost six years. Um, it's been around for a lot longer. Um, and there's a, there are 10,000 plugin modules. Um, you know, how do you do a photo gallery in Drupal? <laughs> there are a million ways. So um, um, I think moving to Drupal 8, one of the concerns is going to be finding standard, more standardized best practices. And Drupal 8 data architecture allows a lot more to be done straight in the core and straight in the user interface with entity reference and so on. So there's going to be a little less room for sort of idiomatic solutions. But there's, there's, a, there's been a huge, we were telling a story centered on Drupal, centered on a technology. Um, and then of course you discover that agency A and B and C and D and E, one uses panels and, and one uses context and one uses you know, views and one hates all that and uses some, and there are a lot of ways to skin this cat. And sure, if you work with one group who's done something one way and you move to another group, it's actually, it's not a different technology, but it's, it's very, very different under the hood. I don't know what the final good solution is. I know what Acquia is doing around, uh, around this problem. Um, we recognize this working with Pfizer, um, it, it, who had, uh, they complained bitterly about exactly this after they make a big bet on Drupal. Um, so Acquia is creating a Drupal 8 distribution called Lightning. And Lightning is a very, very opinionated way to put together Drupal. Lightning says, this is an enterprise distribution. Um, it must be scalable. It must have the following workflows. It must support like a, a kind of a basic fundamental functionality set, which is more or less good for a lot of use cases. And this and this and this, and the data is this way, and this is the editing, this is the workflow, and it just does all that so that if you use that distribution, right, um, all of these decisions have been made and whatever comes on top might be different, but there's a lot more commonality. And I think that that's a path that we need to find. I think there should be maybe the equivalent, like build it off of Lightning, but like the equivalent for NGOs because right? there's a ton of NGO investment in Drupal. Um, and I think, I think that's something that we geeks in the room could really think about, like trying to standardize our practices now and be more disciplined about cooperation. But I'm sorry, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a real, it is a real problem. Okay, thank you very much. That was the last question. And the, the Hooray! Question.